So I'm going to talk today about uh, running a software project at university and how we use uh, Swift in our projects. It's very much more a sort of you know, high level project management um, organization talk. Like, you know, how, how are we thinking about these things? How are we solving the problems? There's been you know, a lot of great talks about Swift technology, about you know, security, as we've just seen. Um, and you know what? Writing a program in a university is the same as writing a program in an office or at your laptop at home. In fact, of course, I have been writing programs on my laptop at home uh, throughout 2020. So you know, that, that's why I'm kind of focusing on uh, the sort of higher level project stuff, because that's really where the differences are and where it gets a bit interesting. So, um, well, hello, everyone. Uh, I have a, a job title, which is Research Software Engineer, um, which, you know, obviously it has software engineer in it, but like, what's the difference? You know, what, what about research uh, makes it specific? Well, the team I'm on is in the computer science department at Oxford University, but we collaborate with people across the entire university. So uh, just recently, I've been working on a project called uh, Global.Health, which is a data science platform related to uh, the COVID-19 pan pandemic and the uh, data that's being generated through trying to manage control and ultimately uh, you know, solve the problems that have been introduced by COVID-19. Uh, you can see on the um, screenshot from our website here that we worked with the Department of Education as well. We work with uh, psychologists, with uh, environmental scientists, with mathematicians, physicists. Uh, and so really what happens is that people in the university, so academics, researchers who have problems where the problem can be solved with a computer come to us for expertise about you know, how we're going to uh, write that program or how we're going to scale something that works well for an academic in their, um, you know, like on their own laptop or on their own desktop computer, how to get that out into the world and to make sure that you know, the impact of it is being felt uh, by everybody who should have access to it. Uh, we do a, a lot of other stuff. You know, one of my uh, personal missions in the university is I would like to make sure that all research, well, you know, everyone associated with research from uh, PhD students to uh, professors, like the entire academic community, has at least an understanding of how software can make their research better. So we do a lot of training in things like version control, because, you know, if you've if you're in, say, a maths department in a university and you've learned some Python from your, uh, your PhD supervisor or from a textbook, you maybe haven't learned what Git is or why it's useful. And so you see the you know the usual like uh, file underscore one dot Swift and then file underscore one dot v two dot final dot final dot Swift and so on. Uh, and so just making sure that people understand things like uh, how to test software, when to release a new version using you know, semantic versioning or some other reasonable scheme for uh, letting people know that there's new versions of their software. Uh, you know, these are all things that are going to help with this mission. But I'm going to leave the sort of training side uh, to one side now and really focus on how we write software with academics in order to uh, help solve their research problems. Uh, because ultimately, it's writing software that's you know, brought everybody in this conference together. It's, you know, it's what we do. It's uh, what we enjoy doing. And so let's, you know, let's see how we do that. So uh, what happens? You know, uh, we've got these, uh, these projects I've talked about, like global.health or like language screen. How did those come about? And how did we get involved? Um, basically, people come to us with problems that they, uh, they need us to help with. There's a form on our uh, group's website that uh, yeah, the researchers in the university can fill in and say what their problem is, um, what help they need, uh, very importantly, whether they have money 
uh, to pay for our time and where that money is coming from. Um, and you know, and then we sort of uh, evaluate their projects and, um, and and take them forward and see how we can help. We have to do quite a bit of filtering at this point. I think when we opened the form, so I've been on this team for about 18 months and um, the the team was much smaller before I joined. There's uh, eight of us on it now and there were, I think I was the fourth person. Uh, and so when it started, like two and a half years ago, they put the form up live on the website and uh, you know, within a couple of weeks had about, uh, 20 projects come in, which would have kept those uh, early people going for like a good few years. And of course, the, the rate at which people you know, find out about us increases and then the amount of work that comes in increases. So we maybe have you know, 10 to 15 times as much work that we're asked to do as we could like reasonably do. So how do we work out what we're going to do and how do we take it forwards? Uh, well, you know, some, sometimes it's a research problem that's going to have uh, interesting research impact. So uh, with Global.Health, the problem that we have is that there are existing techniques for uh, tracking the data about ec epidemics. So the, the collaboration that we're working with, they started in um, about 2015, I think. And you know, they could track. Uh, they, they they worked on earlier uh, epidemics, um, flu, both in humans and animals. Uh, earlier, like coronavirus outbreaks, like uh, you know, the SARS outbreak in China, and uh, and they were very successful. But uh, their process relied on volunteers looking for sources of information about um, these infectious cases, and then writing it into uh, a form. Now, it, uh, of course, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic really started to um, sort of break into the news cycle in about December 2019, January 2020, and had been uh, a problem in China for a very short amount of time before that. And when they brought this uh, process into uh, tracking data, by like late January or into February, it was already clear that there was just too much happening too quickly uh, for for them to be able to cope. And interestingly, they were storing their uh, data in Google Spreadsheets, and it was uh, becoming too big for Google Spreadsheets to be able to cope with. It turns out that there's a a limit on a Google Sheet of about five million cells in a spreadsheet, and you know, if you've got 10 million cases of a, uh, uh, of a disease to track, so that's half a cell per row, uh, you, you just can't do it. Um, so you know, this was clearly an important problem that would um, help to improve not only the, uh, the data tracking and recording that was going on, but then the availability of that data for like, subsequent analysis, for future forecasting of how uh, the disease spreads, and of you know, management, not only of uh, policies related to like COVID-19, but also um, you know, future public health problems of similar scale. So, yeah, this is clearly a very important problem and one that we want to, uh, to help to solve. But sometimes researchers don't have problems that are pure research. So there's this idea of the intent to commercialize uh, where you know, universities now uh, not only um, have to consider their their research and the quality of the work that they're publishing in the scientific literature, but also opportunities for uh, getting that out into the public, either by uh, sharing with um, commercial institutions or by licensing the technologies themselves. So sometimes our work sits in a sort of um, halfway house between a, uh, a research project and like, a commercial app. So um, this Radio 4 program, uh, Costing the Earth, was um, uh, interviewed a, uh, a researcher, Gavin Killip, from our 
Environmental Change Institute um, about the uh, the carbon emissions problem and climate change effects of having like inefficient buildings. Um, so you know a lot of new buildings are built with uh, modern double glazing, modern like heating and cooling systems, um, very efficient uh, water systems, and uh, and so on. But that isn't being introduced into um, existing buildings, and so that means that a lot of older buildings that are being heated up, that heat is just escaping into the atmosphere. It costs more to heat them. It, uh, it burns more fuel and uh, it has a bigger like, you know, impact on the environment, on, uh, on like global temperatures and CO2 levels. Now, the, what, what you do is a kind of well-known problem, like, you know, how you can change roofing materials to make uh, insulation better, uh, install better heating systems. You know, these are problems that are well understood and where technology has really uh, improved uh although <laughs> saying that um my house has one of those uh, smart thermostat things that you can control through apple home and even though it's physically plugged in and is next to my hub um apple home can't see it at the moment so i can't actually turn my heating on so you know this modern technology stuff isn't like uh you know it, it, it isn't 100 percent successful but it's definitely an improvement on what was there in the past People don't always know what the impacts of it are. They don't know what the risks associated with uh, upgrading their house are, what the costs and benefits are going to be. So there's clearly an amount of you know, public education. If someone is doing a home improvement project, they need to uh, be aware of the environmental impacts of the work that they're going to do or of not doing the work uh, and, you know, and then factor it into their decision making. Um, so this uh, group in the Environmental Change Institute had like, a, you know, a, a fantastic knowledge base with like pictures and um, spreadsheets and like loads and loads of data. But how do we get that into people's hands? How do we you know, make it something that actually changes the way that people think about their houses and uh, the environmental impacts of their housing? Um, what we do is we put that information into an app and we make it accessible to people uh, as they need it. Uh, and we'll look more at this, uh, this project later in the talk. Then, of course, there are like purely uh, uh, commercial problems where people who have uh, connections with the university who have maybe already gone through that journey from research through commercialization and now have their startup um, need to develop their app further or needs to uh, take their project uh, forwards and need our help with that. Um, so Oxford Cognitive Screen is from the psychology department in our university and uh, it's related to being able to uh, assess the um, cognitive skills of someone who is either known or suspected to have had a stroke. Uh, and you know this is obviously important for working out what um, it, it, what their current health status is, what uh, assistance they're going to need, whether they need uh, emergency treatment, whether they're deteriorating, and so on. So you have very clear health benefits, um, but also you need to take this thing that has been developed by some academics and that works if like you know, someone who's well trained in the system does a one on one interview with a um you know with a patient which might cost you a thousand pounds uh to uh, carry out and then put it into a context where it can be delivered at scale in say uh care homes where you don't want to physically access them because of uh, covid19 you don't want to go and uh, have a face-to-face -face interview with a patient who is already in a uh, a poor health condition or already has other problems you don't want to expose them to greater risk and also uh, you want to like reduce the cost and then increase the scale of delivering uh, these tests. Um, the, my reason for going through these projects is just to give you a sort of sense of how broad uh, the work that we do is, uh, the number of different projects we're uh, working on. Um, and then 
is some idea of why we need to be careful uh, and thoughtful about the technologies that we're choosing because we've already got a lot of um, like problems on our hands understanding all of the problems that people are trying to uh, engage us in. You know, if I've worked on an epidemiolo epidemiology project, a, an environmental change project, and a psychology project with people who are like leading researchers in these fields. So that's already you know, three different academic domains that I have to understand in a reasonable amount of depth before I can even have conversations with the people that I'm working with about what the software that I'm writing should do. You know, do I really want to also be making a load of uh, choices about where well, I'm going to like uh, go and geek out on this like new open source tool that was released last week, or I want to you know, do I really want to sort of change my JavaScript framework every fortnight, or do I want to pick technologies that are just you know well supported, well understood, easy to work with, and uh, easy to uh, to use and to make changes in? So. We get these uh, projects coming in, and like I said, we you know, we may be up to a point now where we get about uh, ten to fifteen uh, proposals for every one project that we are um, that we're going to do, uh, or that we've got the availability to do. Um, and we have like a an initial sort of light touch meeting with people just to work out what kind of time scale they're talking about, which is important not only for working out when the deadlines are, but also when the start dates are, so we can see whether we've actually got people free uh, at the time that they want to begin this project. Um, what the money they've got is and where it's coming from um, and what they expect to achieve in that time. And you know, the, the reasons for this are, one, like feasibility. You know, are we available at the time that they need? Do they have uh, money that's, you know, consistent with the cost of like developing an app or a, a website or whatever they want. Um, and also, have they got a problem statement that translates to a realistic problem to solve? Um, and yeah, that's, that's not always the case, but also are they willing to sort of take some collaboration on, uh, on, on like amending their direction or on picking the best uh, bits of their problem to solve. Because people often, uh, and you, know, you, you see this in commercial software development, not just in academic um, context, but you know, people want everything and they want it yesterday and they've got uh, five pounds that they want to give you. Um, and you know, not that's just not a feasible project. That's not something that's uh, going to uh, be successful uh, or enjoyable for anybody involved, uh, because you know if we if we agree to it and then don't do it, then everybody gets uh, upset. If we don't agree to it and don't get involved at all, then that's a bit upsetting too. Uh, so we need to like work out if we you know if if we have a conversation with you and we say, okay, it sounds like you've got a lot to do. How about we focus on this thing or you've come to us with a complete design for an app, but you haven't uh, tried it out with any users yet. How about we do some prototyping and we get some uh, people in and we you know, run some usability studies and we see whether that feature works for them or, or that feature or you know, whether they even re re recognize this as a thing that they want to use. Uh, if people are open to that, then we're, we're going to have a much more enjoyable time because we're going to learn more about their problem domain and we're going to you know get more invested in the solution and they're going to uh, ultimately get something that is both feasible and beneficial uh, out of it now we need to discuss the elephant in the room which is the uh the picture of the waterfall that i have put on this slide because if we're saying up front we want to know what you want and when you want it and how much you're going to pay for it is that really like an agile way of working or is that you know a bit sort of 1970s a bit uh waterfall well there's there is a bit of a waterfall aspect to it uh mostly due to the way that these projects are funded because um you know a lot of like research projects in academia are funded uh through 
like uh, research councils or even you know, when they're they're commercial, uh, you apply for an amount of money that you say over an amount of time you will deliver the following outputs. So you've kind of committed to a you know a high level budget goal and uh, schedule, um, and anything that we do has to work within that. Uh, which means that what we actually try to do once we've got past this initial discussion is we try to be as flexible as we can and to say, you know what, we are going to like work towards this goal and every week or every two weeks, we're going to uh, meet and talk about where we are on the journey towards this goal and then what is the most meaningful way that we can take this forwards. And you know, it, a project in which somebody says, okay, it looks like what we were trying to do isn't going to work uh, and we're going to spend the rest of the time on this thing that we found would work and would still be helpful, will still produce an outcome at the end that will still satisfy the, um, the, the, the sponsors and the people involved with the project. So it's not always a, a, a bad thing to realize that what you want to do isn't what you're actually going to do. It doesn't mean just like canceling everything, throwing your desk in the air and uh, walking out of the room. It means success. Because ultimately, if we knew how everything was going to work before we started, it wouldn't be research. You know, it wouldn't be finding out things that were previously unknown. It would be uh, like just implementation. It would be sort of coloring in an existing diagram. Um, there's always the chance that something is going to go wrong. And so we want to find people where they want, where, where they're excited about the chance that it's going to go wrong and they want to find out what to do as a result. So in that way, you know, I, I see a lot of parallels between the way that a research group works and the way that a lean startup works. So uh, you know, any of you in the sort of, you know, commercial area who are in sort of uh, startup style businesses, rather than enterprises, or maybe in um, like re research groups or entrepreneurial groups in a commercial organization, will probably recognize uh, a lot of what I said as being relevant to uh, your domain. Um, and I think that's because like the lean startup community has really latched on to the scientific method, which is, of course, what uh, researchers uh, are brought up with they've latched onto that as a way to validate their product ideas and their designs and their business ideas. You start with a hypothesis, you build an experiment to uh, test that hypothesis, and that, that experiment gives you a baseline result which you can measure, you can analyze that result, and then that uh, tells you something about whether your hypothesis was valid or about uh, the context and the environment which you can then build on to learn more by building more hypotheses and more experiments. Uh, and in the lean startup world, you're saying, is this a product that's going to work in the market? In the, in the academic world, you're saying, is this a useful solution to the problem that we identified? Um, but at an abstract level, they're both the same. And of course, they both have this problem of limited funding and a fixed time to get to a goal. You know, if you're uh, running a startup and you get your seed funding from uh, an angel investor or from a VC, they're going to say, you know, here's a hundred thousand, uh, which is going to keep uh, your staff of two going for like you know, nine months or twelve months. Uh, and I want to see that you have sales projections, or that you have you know so many beta users signed up, or that you have some outcome, you know, something to show that this thing is valuable before the end of that time so that we can then go and get the Series A money or so that I can uh, you know, uh, cut you off and, uh, and go and invest somewhere else or so that I can uh, put another uh, small round in to see, like, what you do next. Basically, we're, we're doing the same thing. We're saying um, we've got this money from uh, you know from whatever source a research council and we want to show them that what we're doing with it is valuable so that we can go back and ask for the next round of funding so that we can take it on to the next step 
So, uh, you know, although you may have this sort of uh, vision of academics in their like suits and gowns with their big mortarboard hats and their glasses of port, uh, you know, in, in a, a smoking room doing weird things, actually what they're doing is very similar uh, to what happens in like a startup business. So we always want to find out what is the next important question and what can we do to answer that question quickly so that we either stop asking that question or ask a follow-on question or get a really useful answer that's going to help us achieve some goal. So, uh, you know, again, that is just how the work that we're doing is very similar to what goes on in, uh, you know, in a data-driven startup or a data-driven uh, department in a commercial company. So let's let's actually talk technology. I'm at Swift Heroes. Uh, I've barely mentioned Swift. I think I've mentioned Python and JavaScript, so I've probably already built some enemies in the audience. Let me try and bring this back on topic. Do I use Swift? Well, it'd be weird if I didn't, right? <laughs> why, why would I be here uh, if I wasn't using Swift? Uh, the particular reason that uh, that I use it is that uh, you know I've been in the um, Apple universe for a very long time. I was a, a next step developer is where I learned Objective C. Then I got Mac OS X, uh, and then you know, obviously an iPhone, uh, and so I've uh, an iPad and so on. Uh, I've been following this technology for a very long time, which just means that it's a very comfortable place for me to be and for me to work very quickly on uh on iterating through uis and particularly swift ui has really uh improved that for me um you know being able to just like declare a ui onto some data uh means that it's very simple for me to just like show my ipad to uh someone in a meeting uh you know obviously these days screen sharing i don't I actually sit next to them doing this anymore um and say, what do you think of that? And then uh, you know they, they have some uh, feedback. Often, I can make those changes in the room. So you know the uh, the kind of low level cosmetic stuff. You can very quickly get through the idea that this is you know this is super simple to change. This is trivial stuff. Like you know, you don't need to tell me that that uh, text should be blue instead of green, or that that should be sixteen point instead of fourteen point. Because by the time you finish telling me that, I've moved on, I've I've fixed it. Uh, so you can now start giving me the useful feedback. Like, yeah, it does the information architecture of this app work? Are we showing the right things to the right people? Are we giving them what they need to solve their problem? Uh, and that is enabled by having this like you know, super rapid turnaround of uh, of design ideas through to user interface. Uh, implementations, whether it's in a preview or like you know on a, a real device, um, and of course I'm not the only person on my team who's Mac first, and so we've got that experience. But even the people on my team who don't necessarily come from the same sort of you know Apple fanboy background that I do are still excited about Swift in particular because of uh, some of the things that are being enabled by Swift. There's a lot of new uh, work in scientific computing uh, that Apple announced their numeric package in um, the WWDC uh, this year. Um, a team who I think are mostly from Google have been working on differential programming in Swift, which is the idea that uh, differential equations can be uh, like first class or data types in Swift. And then that means that it becomes very natural to express some scientific problems using Swift. It also means that uh, you can do things like um, neural network programming, um, AI applications in a very natural way in the Swift programming language. So some some of the people in the sort of scientific and math mathematical domains that we talk to are asking about Swift and are wanting to see their solutions in Swift because it has these like uh, numerical computing features that are relevant to their problems. But, you know, cards on the table, we don't exclusively use uh, Swift. We use a, a lot of things. You know, if we've got all of these various projects, all these various contexts, it's it's up to us to, 
you know, to sort of honestly use the right tool for the job, not to tell people that our favorite tool is the right tool for the job and then to use that uh, regardless of the um, the implications or of the uh, costs. So um, we where we've got so many projects and so few people, we typically have a maximum of one person assigned to a project. And that means that for a cross-platform project, it's better for that one person to work on one code base and then make sure it works well on multiple platforms than it is for that one person to maintain three code bases in parallel. And then you know, when someone says, okay, uh, you showed me the uh, the Mac version, can I assume that the Windows and Linux versions work the same? We have to sort of, you know, hem and haw and go, well, actually, we I, I haven't got around to writing those yet. Uh, so we do, in practice, make a lot of use of um, cross-platform tools like Electron on the desktop and uh, React for web or for mobile uh, applications where we can't... Um, yeah, where where we where we actually have to ship a multiple platform solution. That said, we can still you know, uh, do all the sort of prototyping and investigation and research using, say, SwiftUI and doing uh, uh, like an iOS only exploration, and then build out a uh, a cross platform solution once we've actually worked out what the solution to the problem is going to look like. And also at the moment, you know, I mentioned these uh, sort of new developments in scientific computing in Swift, which are you know, very interesting and we're definitely keeping an eye on. And at the same time, have existing people with existing problems where there already are good solutions on other languages. There's a lot of use in the scientific community of um, Python now, which has largely replaced uh, earlier languages like Java and Fortran. C++ still stays around, uh, even like proprietary languages like MATLAB. Uh, and again, in data science, something like Python or R just are uh, already popular. And so uh, you know, you're ignoring a vast library ecosystem if you uh, choose some other technology. So yeah, uh, there's, you know, there's the good news. Swift exists and it's not alone. It's got plenty of friends uh, among the computing uh, world. So. Uh, Let's just have a um, a case study about how I used uh, SwiftUI in a particular project, which is the Eco Retrofit project, uh, which I was talking about earlier with the Environmental Change Institute. So uh, here here is a very glib expression of the problem: the best way to like make the a built environment more energy more energy efficient is to improve the technology that's used to like insulate or heat uh or you know, ge generally like the um the quality of existing structures the best way for an architect to win award is to knock down an existing structure and build a new building well then they've got a load of uh, materials you know bricks and concrete and uh, like glass and so on that came out of the old building they're probably not going to recycle it. It's probably going to go into landfill. Um, it would cost a lot to recycle if they did choose to uh, do that. And then they're going to like create a load of new materials, including glass and concrete and brick and so on, in order to construct their new building. So there's a lot of uh, energy wasted, a load of CO2 generated um, in building a new building. And even if the new building is incredibly... like on the cutting edge of energy efficiency, the fact that you tore down an existing one probably offsets any of the, the advantages you get from your new structure. So what we need to do is we need to uh, essentially change the decision-making process by everybody involved in this sector, right? So the, uh, the architects who are designing the buildings need to take this into account. Uh, the clients who are paying for it, whether that's uh, you know, you at home wanting a new boiler, or uh, a like massive enterprise that wants to build, I don't know, some like massive glass circular building in the middle of Cupertino. At any scale, the people involved need to be aware of this situation of this problem that I've you know very sort of 
uh, glibly described to you and of its impact on their project and on the things they should be considering uh, as they go through their project. So the academics from the Environmental Change Institute came uh, to uh, our group and said, we've got uh, 30,000 pounds, which is probably about, um, I don't know, uh, like 40 something thousand euros, like maybe 46,000 euros or something. Maybe someone will like look up the exchange rate and correct me umbrella while I'm talking, I don't know. Um, anyway, we've got like some amount of uh, money, uh, like the, the cost of a small car, and we've got six months and we want to have an app at the end of this six months. Um, maybe if I understood the problem very well and uh, and they had a good expression of what the solution was and we all agreed that that was the solution to take, maybe we could get to that commercial app in six months with that much budget. Um, it doesn't seem likely particularly in a context where we don't actually know what the problem is that we're trying to solve you know how do i go from this statement here to an app so these were you know these were the good people these were the people where uh, we could have an open discussion and we could say what we could probably do in six months is have a plan to build a commercial app that's based on evidence from building some form of an app and then uh, showing it to the relevant stakeholders and uh, you know, and testing some hypotheses. And you know, these were a very scientifically minded people who are you know, very much up for the idea of making some hypotheses and testing them. And so they came on board with that idea and that's where we went. Now they had this uh, massive knowledge base of uh, information about this problem domain about the uh, specifically the risks involved in retrofitting eco-friendly technologies into existing buildings, but they had that for that in an Excel database, and we knew that it wouldn't be uh, particularly engaging or discoverable to just give someone an Excel database, uh, an Excel spreadsheet, and say, you know, here, "Here you go. Here's all the information you need." So the first thing I could do is you know, because it's Excel. Uh, I can make a Python script very quickly to have a CSV, uh, sorry, to take the CSV form of the Excel and put it into a SQLite database. Now, if I've got a SQLite database, I can very easily access it from uh, from Swift and create a collection of data models that represent the links between the, um, the various pieces of data and the, turn it into a sort of uh, a, an object hierarchy. And so what you see is I build a very lo-fi uh, user interface in SwiftUI using uh, using the SQLite database that I generated from this Excel. And you know it's not by any means beautiful. I'm not uh, giving this talk in the hopes that I win an Apple Design Award. I'm uh, showing you how little design with like you know uh, scare quotes and um you know the ideas of sort of using uh like creative suite or something uh how little design you have to put into something for someone to understand what it does and how to use it you know there was a lot of um sort of frustration i think when uh, ios 7 came out and it uh, got rid of the corinthian leather and the skeuomorphic UI elements of iOS 6 with so much cleaner design, uh, much sort of more minimal and plain. But you know, given black text on a white uh, background, a little bit of color, a lot of use of font sizing, some clear information hierarchy it is actually possible to uh, present information and uh, and for people to either make use of it or, importantly, for people to fail to make use of it, which is a uh, interesting information because it tells me something about uh, whether we're showing the information in the correct way. So then we take this uh, design, you know, this, this kind of lo-fi thing to people in the industry who either would be users or who represent like uh, industry associations. And the questions they ask 
turn out to not be questions that you can answer with the information that we've designed in this app. Now, luckily, at this point, we'd spent a couple of months uh, on iterating through this app. We hadn't spent their entire budget and their six months on delivering a polished version. Uh, so yeah, when we find out a third of the way into the project that what people want is to make sure that they're compliant with the um, the like national standards around uh, eco-friendly construction, not uh, what information is out there. That's the thing that uh, that we need to know. Um, but the fact that we built this thing in SwiftUI meant that changing the presentation of that database to focus on organizing the information around the the standards rather than around the uh, like risk presentation that we had been doing, that that was a very quick uh, piece of work. And so, you know, another couple of weeks and another couple of iterations of so, what do you think of this? Let's uh, you know, let's change it, and we're ready to go to uh, test. <clears throat> excuse me, to test flight and to a wider uh, industry testing. So we published the um, the app on test flight. We have uh, got. Uh, I'd say about 110 uh, testers um, who were recruited through uh, an industry uh, journal, and uh, and we've got very good feedback. So now we're in in a position where, uh, you know, where we can do the lean startup thing. We can demonstrate what we've learned and ask for the next round of funding, which will help help us take on uh, developing the commercial app, which will be the app we actually need, not the app that we thought we needed when we started the project a few months ago. So we're probably going to do that, carrying on with SwiftUI and you know, getting to a point where we know that the UI works well and exposes the information that people need to solve their problems. And then we'll do the cross-platform right. And you know what, maybe we'll keep the, uh, the SwiftUI version on iOS and add something else to Android uh, you know, maybe the uh, the finances would have changed because we won't be constrained by that one person one project thing. When we can you know, demonstrate clearly to investors what the solution is that we're going for, so we've opened up that opportunity. Uh, but you know, if if we carry on the same way, then like, I'll, I'll be entirely frank. We would take what we've learned from this uh, iterative process and we would uh, develop the application as a cross-platform application. So uh, that is how you run an academic project and how you use Swift UI in an academic project. Um, I'm going to uh, like definitely sort of hang around. Uh, I'm going to be on uh, Brella. You can find me on Twitter as well. And if you're interested in like 1990s computers, I also have a Twitch stream uh, where a friend and I uh, program 1990s computers live on Twitch. Uh, but for the moment, um, thank you very much. And I look forward to, uh, to talking to you all.